All right, let's go ahead and start this flight. Um, let me see if I can bring up the map for today's flight. We are just doing a short hop through the Adirondack Mountains. You can see we start off in Adirondack Regional Airport, if I recall correctly, and we're flying down to the southwest to a small Air Force base at the uh, uh, western edge of the uh, National Park. So we're just going to hop over all these lakes and we'll be on our way. Now let's see, hopefully I haven't set the parking brake somewhere. Where would that be? It's a little bit dark in here. Oh, there we go. <laughs> All right. All right, we're just going to taxi over to probably the nearest runway. This one over here. Looks like there's a missing texture too. You can see the purple screen down there. Whoops. using just one uh, notch of flaps. Here we are. We'll be taking off in that direction. And we're off. Super easy with this. Uh, this is, I think, the Kit Fox 78 or something. Super easy takeoff. I didn't even need to do anything. I didn't need to pull up. It just lifted right off. Now let's see if we can't get a better view of the terrain. can see some of the uh, mountains there in the distance. We actually need to turn a little bit to our left to make a more southerly uh, route. Tree. 
Let's go ahead and cancel the flight following. What's it doing? Squawk one zero one four ELDL four tree. ELDL four tree radar contact three miles southwest of Kilo Sierra Lima Kilo three thousand feet. Altimeter two nine or decimal nine or two. Roger ELDL four tree. Now keep in mind, this is like mm, 4 p.m. or thereabouts, you know, autumn time in New York, looking pretty nice. And we're just going to maintain around this heading. I don't think this, uh, no, this type of aircraft does not have any autopilot. Let's uh, see what we've got on here. We've got the fuel pump, we've got the strobe lights on. All right, we're good to go. I'm just gonna make sure we don't drift off course. And I'm also going to try and keep it sort of low, near to the ground, because that's where all the good, uh, that's where all the good views are. So let's take some sweeping angles to try and get in all the, all the good scenery. So there's our path. I'll just uh, leave it at that. I think we're settled now. I can take my hands off the controller and it will mainly do its thing. Looks like it'll just level out. This aircraft flies like a dream. I've never even flown it before. Looks like I just need to do a little bit of correction. I think there's a slight wind from the north, but no problem. Um, so we'll just uh, do a little bit of a against the wind correction every now and again. We want to head essentially around in the, in the direction of the sun. And we'll be at our destination. Oh, we have a warning. What warning? Our fuel is good. Our RPM is probably a little bit high. Let's see if we can't bring that down. Yeah, our oil pressure is a bit high.
these gusts of wind are really blowing us off a little bit off course. Alright, this is a good throttle. Alright, so while we're up here, the main topic of this video is the state of the web in uh, 2021. And as a web developer, where I think it's going, where I think it should go, uh, according to my biased opinion, and maybe what we need to do differently. Because as you may or may not be aware, the web is dominated by two two main types of uh, websites. You've got your old static pages, you know, your what your browser requests a page, the uh, server responds with some HTML, and there's your page, right? Now the other type is uh, dynamic web apps, so to speak, and this is where the the uh, server will serve a ton of JavaScript, and that will use um, you know the built-in functionality of your browser to render a an animated a lively page that can do things and that's reactive and that seems to be where the web is headed right we seem to be headed in a direction where more and more people are building web apps for their application because that's by far the easiest way to reach a global audience Right? with an application that looks and feels like it could be a traditional desktop application with all of the modern advantages of a, a networked um, styles application that you would normally only see in like desktop application frameworks like Qt or maybe even Java effects nowadays and you can get all of that super easy with a low barrier to entry with web apps and nowadays People are even just saying, you know, screw this, let's make everything a web app, like Discord and Slack and so forth. You know, just make a web app and boom, now you also have an Android app and an iOS app and a native desktop application because you use Electron and you just build a tiny little Chromium browser into your, um, into your system, right? So now we've got the case where basically any corporation that wants to reach a, the largest audience possible will make a web application for their um, for their system right and what I think that's doing is I think that's introducing an unbelievably large amount of dependency on certain monopolies and it's leading to a lot of unnecessary inefficiency you know um, for all the good that Google has done for the internet, they own over 70% of all web browsers, so to speak. Um, the vast, vast majority of the market share of the browser market is dominated by Chromium-based browsers, right? You've got, of course, Google Chrome and Edge and... Um, and like Opera nowadays, and then you've also got browsers like Brave and I think Ecosia and a few others. Uh, well, actually, a lot more nowadays, but they're all based off of Chromium. And basically, whenever the Google developers say they want to uh, enact some new change, some breaking change, it's basically up to everyone else to cave and say, "Okay, yes, we will accept this change." All right? That's a a bit of an issue, and it's also a bit of an issue because now anyone who's building an application for someone to use is building it primarily for Google's particular um, set of products, right? Um, and I don't think that this is ideal for, for everyone. I think that um, by limiting, by having everyone become limited to web browser um, web apps, we are basically reducing the efficiency of of just your everyday tasks um, and we're 
we're choking out a lot of innovation. Oh, come on. Turn off the... Uh... There we go. Um, yeah, so as I was saying, um, before I got interrupted, um, I think that in the current ecosystem, we're at a point where we're sort of where the user base for your standard web browser has amassed such a cult following that it's impossible to do anything without having it be available on the web as a web app and as an Android app and an iOS application. And that leads to a lot of issues, you know, because now everyone's building their frameworks built around a, um, a specification that was designed decades ago for a static web that wasn't designed initially to handle large amounts of dynamic data, right? You've got new things like web sockets and you've got things like um, WebAssembly that are finally starting to take a uh, take hold, but they're all rooted in the um, in the concept of the old web of static pages, right? And yeah, it's as someone who, for the most part, has dealt with compiled languages, and uh, you know, I've I've done my fair share of Python and and JavaScript when I need to. Uh, at work, but the the inefficiency there is just it's hard to reconcile, right? Because what everyone who's using web apps is doing, in my opinion, is just um, building something to work around the massive amount of inefficiency um, that is the you know the standard suite of web software, right? Because they have to build something that's going to render, that's going to work and render in a browser, um, and someone's browser is obviously going to be doing a lot more than just rendering their page, right? So you're introducing the inefficiency of someone having to have uh, essentially a full rendering engine and backbone just to render your web app, right? Versus something like GTK for C. Right, because GTK, you compile it, um, it's just native code, it's super fast, super lightweight, and yeah, the standard argument to that is, well, it's lightweight, but it's a pain to, to set up. You know, it takes forever to build an application on for the desktop that looks good and is responsive, you know, and it's easy to do that nowadays with something like ExpressJS or or Vue or React Native allows you to do cross-platform things, Flutter even, but these solutions are all introducing huge amounts of inefficiency just for the convenience of being able to develop something quickly. But what happens then, you know? Because now you've got an application that you've de developed, but it uses hundreds of times more CPU cycles, and it uses hundreds of times more RAM than a native application, and let's say you're part of the 0.01% of developers whose app becomes famous, right? You're, for some reason, people just love your idea and they all gravitate towards it. It's like the new Facebook or the new Reddit or something. And you built it on a platform that basically requires people to have a running web browser just to view your content. And the problem with that is that now you've got millions or you know, in the case of Facebook or YouTube or or Instagram, you have billions of people, billions of users all doing this at the same time, then it starts to count, right? Then you have to step back and say, wait a minute, this, what we're doing is we're, we're introducing several orders of magnitude of overhead that we don't, that we can't afford, right? Because it's inefficient for the lowest end of devices, which you can almost argue is a form of discrimination by not supporting um, because yeah there are huge huge proportions of the population that simply can't afford the latest Samsung Galaxy S20 right or the latest iPhone 15 um, and so you're, you've got people stuck with um, hardware that's 5, 10 years old maybe even 15 years old at some points and a lot of times 
you're, de you're developing an application that provides a service and you want to make a, be uh, a good faith effort to support as many people as you can and web applications aren't the way to do that and that's why you need some sort of native implementation right yeah that's that's one case I have against web applications and the other is just the the raw inefficiency you know because I you know I've I've made this claim before and it's always um, you know brushed away like uh, this is just wistful thinking you know this this uh, exists on scales which we don't ever deal with but the uh, the fact of the matter is is that having millions of computers millions of people's office computers uh, running slack for example that's a browser or that's a, a minified version of chromium running right there imagine if millions of desktops all around the world in offices were now using a native application that used one percent of the memory that it currently does or let's say let's be generous and say ten percent of the uh, CPU cycles right that would be a massive savings in power right and that's just one example imagine if every app that we use nowadays ended up like that we would be ending we would end up with actual tangible amounts of energy savings right and this uh, brings into question the morality of uh, are are we as developers responsible for the efficiency of our of our code right because yeah we can uh, make the claim that yeah we want to do web apps because it's super easy you just have to develop one simple thing and it works everywhere and it just works right but then we're setting the bar at just it works right that's that's how low we're setting the bar at. We're no longer saying, well, does it work well? Does it, is it fast? Is it efficient? We're just saying, does it work at least, right? And I think we should go back to setting the bar much higher for releasing uh, software that gets used by millions of people, right? Because we're doing a bit of a disservice to, to, to everyone by releasing software that isn't as reasonably optimized as it can be for a given scenario right and yeah this is super subjective but my view is that it's it's not morally right to be able to release an extremely inefficient piece of software and have millions of people use it and yeah like for example let's take a SQL Lite. what if SQLite was written as a pure Python application, right? So people had to run an instance of Python to use to utilize SQLite. Now, yeah, there's not really much wrong with that on the surface. You know, Python is a pretty popular language. Everyone has Python installed on their computers. Um, however, SQLite is arguably one of the most popular pieces individual pieces of software ever produced, right? There are estimated trillions of copies of this, right? And if there are trillions of copies of SQLite out there in the world running on multiple devices, this this uh, figure that is given by SQLite, um, SQLite's website indicates that there's probably multiple instances of SQLite on every single device in the world, right? So things like um, like your smartphone has probably thousands of them. Um, every computer, every server has them. Um, and then at that point, it starts to matter. But then what do you do? Right? As a developer of SQLite, in, le in our fictional Python scenario, what do we do? Because we wrote our entire application. We built our entire structure around using a language that's suited for rapid development but it's not suited for optimized development, right? Do we then at, do we then pick an arbitrary milestone and say once we hit, you know, one billion downloads, then we'll switch over, then we'll refactor, then we'll write the whole thing in C plus plus or Rust or or in D or whatever, right? And that doesn't really seem to be the case for modern web applications, right? It doesn't seem to be the case that people. Uh, look around and say okay we've done it this way so far now we need to 
scrap everything and do it optimized. And that's the problem, is then you end up with huge amounts of waste. Another example of this is, um, yeah, is Bitcoin, right? Because, uh, because Bitcoin's um, entire model is based around the proof of work policy for the blockchain, where you get rewards based off of the amount of hashing you do. Um, and that reward is diminishing with the amount of work that's done cumulatively over the entire blockchain. And so you end up with this case where there are entire farms dedicated to just computing hashes of, uh, of Bitcoin transactions solely to gain a few, uh, a few uh, Bitcoin. And then the energy costs become astronomical, right? It, like the cost of running, of maintaining Bitcoin itself is basically the energy costs of some small countries, right? Compared to uh, traditional um, financial transactions, which granted they're probably not optimized as well as they could be, but at the same time, they've been scaling much more feasibly for their uses, right? And so that's that's just one example where where people started out using a technology um, that makes something very, very usable, very easily accessible for the average person, but at some arbitrary point, you have to draw the line and say this approach is not is not possible without you know causing significant harm to to the ecosystem, right? Um, so, for example. Um, You've got Discord, and that has you know a, an Android application. It's got a desk, desktop application. It's got a web application, and it's all running with Electron. And there are hundreds of millions of Discord users. And if each of them has some form of of Discord, and almost no one uses the browser version, um, it means that they're all running an extra Chromium browser, and that's wasting a lot of energy once you uh, once you consider the sheer scale at which it operates and I think that uh, that in the future we need to change things and there's one initiative that is that does seem to be uh, uh, going in the right direction and that's um, WebAssembly right because uh, way back what was it uh, 2008 or so um, Back when Java was in its heyday, um, people were using uh, Java applets to execute native code from the browser, right? And this allowed um, web applications to have dynamic content and 3D rendering and all sorts of cool features that they couldn't normally get with uh, JavaScript at the time. And it looks like web WebAssembly is finally replacing that by allowing us to essentially compile um, a set of bytecode that can run in a browser's virtual machine. So it's essentially, what it feels like to me as a Java developer is it feels like a different flavor of Java applets that's a lot more modernized and uh, doesn't include the entire um, verbosity of the Java applet um, ecosystem, right? So. I think that this has the opportunity to have a great impact on um, on the web application area because what it is essentially doing is allowing us to almost for free optimize our applications to native code or as close you know as close to native as Java is right Java bytecode some sort of WebAssembly browser bytecode. Um, and that I think will allow us to uh, will allow us to sidestep a lot of the burden that would come with otherwise developing a native application, right? Now, the problem I see with that is that it's being or it's being introduced as sort of a bandage applied onto the existing web stack. You know, the the global stack of all. The web technologies, you've got your HTML, CSS, then you've got JavaScript, and then there's WebAssembly on top of that, um, which provides 
the some functionality to replace JavaScript in some cases, right? Um, now, the problem with that is that we're still running on what I consider to be a bit of an inefficient um, system with uh, HTML and CSS um, because those those technologies were designed primarily for static web pages again, right? You know, you've got your HTML. It's just an XML document that dis explains the structure of your uh, website. And then you have CSS to style it and done, right? That's done. But this does not translate well to dynamic content and web applications or essentially if this, if HTML was designed for desktop applications and native applications for any sort of interface, we'd have a very, very different approach, right? Um, because HTML was designed primarily in a time when no one had any concept of what a web application was or or what the further applications were of sharing content beyond just browsing simple you know Wikipedia articles and all that and the problem is now that um, other frameworks have shown that you can still keep the XML format while introducing the necessary um, uh, elements to make it um, you know, not a pain to develop, right? Um, Android does this with a lot of its components and layouts. Um, JavaFX recently has been uh, doing that with its FXML uh, dialect of XML. And it shows that um, the XML language is still pretty good at, uh, at representing the content of some sort of dynamic application. It's just it needs to be more domain oriented, you know? It needs to be focused mainly on one thing or the other. I don't think it's it's convenient for either use case. If we have some sort of compromise and say, okay, static pages can be done using a subset of our dynamic approach. Or dynamic websites, as they are nowadays, are done using basically a subset of the technologies that are used for generating static sites because static sites is still by and large the default for the web right I think that there should be uh, there should be a much more intuitive way to design web applications um, similar to the layout frameworks that you see in Android and iOS in Java effects in QT you know they make it all very simple and some some companies have actually started to capitalize on this this uh, phenomenon by developing their own solutions. Like I think, um, what is it? WebStorm, I think the name is, is like has some sort of fancy editor online that abstracts away all of the garbage of plain HTML and plain CSS and gives you a modern user interface editor and we need this, just not paywalled behind certain corporations' own implementations. We just need that to be the open standard for the web is is a more available, more uh, domain-oriented approach. Because, yeah, right now, in order to develop an application that's accessible for everyone in the world, you need to know HTML, you need to know CSS, you need to know some sort of JavaScript framework, you need to know some sort of back-end server framework. Um, and yeah, you can hire a, sta a full stack developer for that, but you're, unless you're paying a lot of money, you're not gonna get anything good, you know? This sort of thing requires a full team when it shouldn't need to, right? Developing a single small application is something that can be done by a single person. Um, and I think that there is actually value in keeping the scope limited such that it is possible for a single person to develop uh, a full application like they do a lot of times in you know desktop applications or simple Android applications um, but right now with the ecosystem the way it is um, it introduces so much additional overhead to have 
one person developing a front end framework in JavaScript, you know, just some base HTML. They've got to do some CSS styling uh, for their dynamic components, which is an absolute pain. Um, then they have to worry about uh, setting up some sort of authentication and API and all this extra stuff. Um, and it just turns into so much wasted effort on the part of the developer. And then at the end of the day, it turns into wasted energy because of the fact that web apps in this particular style are generally inefficient, right? Because it requires an entire browser to just function and show you some basic um, buttons and, and graphs and whatever. Um, when what, what should happen is that a developer, a single developer should be able to say, okay, I'm going to make this simple structure. I'm going to have buttons here. I'm going to have buttons there. And they pass it off to a designer. Designer says, okay, no, do this, do this instead. And it's easy to change the structure of that. And then the developer is able to um, provide functionality to, to all the stuff on the screen and do everything that they need to without having to perform the intricate ballet between front end, back end, styling, user experience, and so forth, you know? I think that um, as it stands right now, the the term web application is a little bit disingenuous because behind most web applications is in fact an entire backbone of extra technologies and, and uh, services that are running just to keep things afloat, right? You, you don't ever just have a single program running somewhere on the cloud, and that is your application. You have your JavaScript, you've got your API, you've got your database somewhere, you might have a, a cache, right? And then you've got um, some sort of uh, certificate system, right? And all of this um, adds significant um, cost to entry to make it more and more difficult for someone to build something for the modern web. So yeah, I think that that uh, it's, it's just getting to a point where the ecosystem requires years of knowledge to be able to do something and produce an application that is actually uh, able to be consumed by consumers on any uh, browser. And I think that uh, that needs to change. Oh, it looks, looks like we're going to a cloud here. Let's see if we can dip back down. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, my rant against web applications, huh? Now, like I mentioned before, the, the two main primary um, benefits of web applications is simply the fact that you can First of all, you can run them anywhere on any device that supports a browser, which is literally any device nowadays. Um, and on top of that, they are relatively easy to develop for a software development team, right? So a lot of companies are already set up in this way because it's been how it's been done for the past decade or so. Um, so no reason to change. But the problem that we run into is that now we're sort of perpetuating an ecosystem where new companies aren't just making the most efficient software possible, they're just making whatever works with the current ecosystem because they have to. Because making a more efficient approach is just completely un unfeasible. And I think that's the tragedy that we have here. Is that um, there's such a vast, vast majority of users that depend on the browser as their main source of all content, right? And I think that it would be better if we were able to make some sort of better content delivery system where we can develop a, a way to provide native applications to people on different devices in a way that does not require them to run them inside of a, of a of a browser sandbox, right? That is the so-called dream of web developers everywhere is that you can have the benefits of native software 
and have the benefits of easy to use dynamic web applications without all the drawbacks that come with building stuff for the web using the standard um, ecosystem. Uh, so yeah, that uh, it seems like a bit of wishful thinking, doesn't it, right? Because we, um, we're in a place where we, uh, if, you know, if we want to put food on the table, we just have to follow what, um, what's being done. But I think that as time goes on, we're going to get more solutions like WebAssembly and WebSockets that bring us closer and closer to a, a, a so-called gold, golden uh, area where we've got the benefits of compiled, you know, native performance. Um, and so we lose all the overhead of a browser. Now, WebAssembly isn't quite there just yet because you still need a browser. But my hope is that eventually we are able, or society, I guess, is able to ship some sort of generic interface that everyone can have that provides a native uh a native ecosystem for applications to run in a way that is a lot more performant than current, um, you know, the, the, the Chromium stack. All right, so looks like we are headed towards our destination. And we are mainly out of the mountains. Just some hills here and there. So we're going to go ahead and reduce power. And see if we can drop down a little bit. kick it up a notch see if we can get there in record time um, but yeah the the point is um, yeah I developed for the web because that's um, that's what I gotta do but I wish it were in a better place you know I wish it were I wish developing for the web were as efficient as developing a native desktop application you know I wish that we didn't have to sacrifice um, performance and you know maintainability for the developer because develop, developing a web application involves this this you know very intricate ballet between the API between authenticating a user between um, all these things that you just don't need when you're developing something natively, right? Imagine if Photoshop was a full-on web application and the millions of people that used Photoshop had to now use it in a browser, how much additional waste that would incur, you know? And I'm sort of an idealist in that I think we can do better. All right. So, as we can see on the map, there is our lake to the left and then we see that other winding creek up ahead and we're going to cross that turn to our left and there should be the uh, airport looks like we're at 3,000 feet or thereabouts so we're going to go ahead and continue dropping a little bit we're going to keep the uh, throttle up high see how we can uh, get on with should be fine seeing as our uh, this aircraft is made for acrobatics and if we look at the airport coming up I think what we're gonna do is come in on this runway here come in from this side then we can get a nice uh, little over the we can bypass the airport and go over the little river creek thing and uh, get a nice view. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, bank us that way.
All right, there's our smaller lake. We'll continue turning a little bit further and see if we can um, essentially follow the sunset. Alright, looks like we'll just follow this, uh, this creek. You can see it just shining off in the, in the horizon. And then we'll continue that way till we come across the uh, larger river up ahead. Let's adjust the trim. So yeah, rant of the day. I don't like the efficiency or the inefficiency of um, this web applications nowadays. And yeah, you might be thinking, okay, so if it all sucks, what should we do about it? Well, yeah, the problem is I don't I don't know exactly, and the problem is that I don't think anyone really knows a good solution because we're all, you know, universally dependent on the current web. Uh, ecosystem for all our livelihoods, right? That's how the world works. The world is built off of the uh, current web, but uh, you know, it, it leaves a bad taste in your mouth when you see that it's all just a massive patchwork of things, right? And you feel like a centralized organization of all of, all of the functionality that we need could make everything a lot easier for everyone and yeah that's the ideal that everyone's trying to strive for It looks like we're headed uh, back into civilization. As you can see up ahead on the left, down there, that open field looks to be a uh, natural gas fracking area. Ouch. All right, we're just, uh, just below 3,000 feet. So we're gonna keep on straight ahead and then turn right in there. Gonna lower us down a little bit more. And there's our creek veering off to the right. Let's see. There's not even landing lights on this thing, it looks like. Oh well. But, anyways, as we approach uh, our destination, I'll thank you for uh, <laughs> for paying attention for my for my little rant for the day. Um, and we should be coming in to land in just a few moments. Here we've uh, just entered the uh, 
I think it's class D airspace. And we're uh, just going to make our way. We're going to try and take a look at this area. Edit, head in on that particular point. And there's our there's our airport. All right, 2,500 feet. We're gonna begin, begin throttling back. And I'll adjust the trim accordingly. Let's see, we're going to try and go for 50, 50 knots maybe. Yeah, again, like I've said, I don't really, uh, stall speed 30 kilometers per hour, okay. This is my term, my first time flying this aircraft, so I'm not really sure how it handles. There's our runway to the right. Flaps set one. Flap set two. All right, let's set the trim up. All right. Looks like we're a little high, but this is a bushcraft airplane, so it does not matter too much. 
just uh, take it a little bit steep. I also don't want to be that guy, but my controller does suck. It's um, just an old Logitech Extreme 3D joystick from, I think it's like near 10 years old it seems at this point, so I mean, it, I have a dead zone of more than 50%, so it's difficult to make fine adjustments. But here we are on the home stretch. And here we are. So just a quick uh, short hop. Thanks for joining me.